Aaron, thanks for uh, sticking through this with us. I don't know, uh, I know my head's exploding. Who's having, a, who's had a, 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 at least a few moments of, uh, of clarity there. Um, thanks a lot for coming out. Uh, we're gonna talk today about um, uh, some, some of the things you might have already seen in some of the other tracks. So I've, I've peeled some things out. I'm gonna give shout outs to folks who've already done exemplary jobs in this space, especially in the ML track. Um, we're going to talk about uh, a platform, the Kubernetes platform that we've built to support decisioning at an FI, our employer's Capital One. Uh, I'm Keith, uh, this is Bryce, this is Gavin, and we'll carve out different pieces. Our colleague Ravi Dubey, unfortunately, couldn't be here today. Um, he's a little bit allergic to the cold. Um, so, Ravi, Ravi does not like the cold. Um, we really enjoyed seeing snow in Austin yesterday. It, was, it felt like a a bucket list item. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our, uh, the cluster that we've built. We're sort of the platform and the site reliability engineers uh, for the platform uh, and some of what our uh, tenant workloads uh, look like, the kinds of support we provide. We really come from the software engineering side, but building kind of cross stack capabilities in the decisioning and ML space but uh, don't hold us to uh, too deep uh, capabilities in ML. We're just getting there via decisioning at this point. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, uh, some of our, our overall mission and Bryce is gonna talk to um, cluster installation and ops, um, some of the uh, nuances of, uh, of our um, s platform engineering and site uh, SRE engineering um, requirements for working for uh, an FI. Um, and Gavin's going to talk to um, our uh, sort of encapsulation and uh, pro provisioning better multi-tenancy experiences, customer experiences for what we view as a, a PaaS for decisioning. So we've been uh, in production um, since the second quarter. Uh, we started on, and I'm sorry, I'm going to look on some of these slides because it cut off on the speaker display here, um, starting in version 1.6. Uh, we are currently deployed production to single region, multi-AZ, homogeneous node types. We use M410XLs, uh, roughly just under 10 of them to support uh, the workload types I list below. Um, one interesting thing that everybody at the firm, every tech team, um, platform team, app team at the firm has to go through is a 60-day complete rehydration from uh, the AMI on up for their application. Um, everyone hates it, but it has, I have to say, it's probably instilled quite a lot of discipline for resiliency, patching, uh, et cetera. So um, we, you, know, you, you get very quickly to a point where you re can rehydrate your entire environment, and then that supports accelerated upgrades, better resiliency. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of benefits have been paid. If you ever want to beat yourself with that stick, um, please use the patterns we've, we've outlined um, here. Um, we, as much as we hate them, we, we, we also, it's a love-hate thing. Um, so the types of workloads we run are uh, two types that are domain-specific workloads on the cluster. Um, one for real-time, one's real-time are kind of OLTP stream, uh, decisioning streams, decisioning for transaction streams for a retail bank. Um, and that's approximately, like we have one app that handles around 600, or six million transactions a day, between six and 10, starting to get noisy now that it's the retail season. Uh, and we store quite a bit of, we retain uh, 180 days of data, which uh, you'll see as we get in the, the fact that we're um, streaming with Kafka is a little bit of an unusual pattern for Kafka. Most people don't retain that much data when they work with Kafka. So we've had that requirement and that's been a little bit unusual for, for our installation. Um, we run uh, batch-based model refits. Uh, so, we, as I said, we're decisioning on the edge of ML. We do run uh, model uh, POJO models um, that are exported from H2O, and you'll see where those come in. So then we do use, also use Pachyderm for refitting those models and to be able, and using batches of various versions of data um, to uh, replay those models or retest those models to improve, mature, and compete those models. Um, our other set of workloads are ad hoc analytical queries for data analysts um, and data scientists. 
Um, and our final set of workloads, which probably everybody has, are telemetry stacks uh, for logging, monitoring, cluster services, housekeeping jobs, the various cron tabs you run to back up state and, and so forth. Um, so those uh, array out in the following way. Um, in our T1 um, and T2, that is all uh, stateful um, and uh, all multi-tenant. So we have multiple customer teams, multiple application teams running Flink apps. Um, right now in a single Flink cluster, Gavin's gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, breaking how those, uh, how we meet the needs for teams who are really doing Kafka-based, Kafka and Flink-based development for their core decisioning application um, and how we are working to uh, as Kelsey Hightower talked about, wrap some of the capabilities of Kubernetes, make Kubernetes invisible um, so that they can concentrate on their core decisioning. And by decisioning apps, um, I mean everything from fraud um, to clickstream analytics. Uh, we're constant, we were sort of uh, given raison d'etre from the fraud budget, but we have um, expanded the decisioning capability and offered the decisioning capability um, across the bank. Um, our NIFI workloads ma manage ETL into and out of the platform. Um, Kafka's our backbone um, and actually has become the kind of cross-service uh, bus for, uh, re for, for teams who are refactoring their Flink apps. Um, all kinds of M interesting MVW sort of pat pattern work that's going on in the Flink space. Uh, once you get to uh, breaking up your Flink app into, into a richer ecosystem of, of sub-applications for uh, determining a decision and then visualizing the decision, um, querying state against the decision, interim Kafka topics to support all of those, those interim states. Um, Pachyderm, as um, Dan at, from Pachyderm yesterday talked about, um, is a tool unique to uh, Kubernetes which allows for um, state versioning of data and then triggering thereof, uh, triggering model pipelines, model refit pipelines, and event pipelines using batches and micro batches. The analytical environment, uh, Apache and Drill. Um, Apache provides a notebook capability just like Jupyter, um, and Drill provides the connectors to various data sources. You'll see in our case, um, S3 Lake, um, uh, Aurora, Postgres, um, Aurora MySQL, ver dot, 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 various uh, stateful sources for uh, uh, accessing data and then Drill bringing the data together and then uh, Zeppelin presenting the data. Um, and then we, we have the standard, sort of standard as I've seen across so many implementations, um, logging or telemetry stacks. So um, an EFK, um, shared EFK stack across um, our environment and a shared um, metric stack, um, the HIG stack, Heapster, Influx, and Grafana. Um, and then we run, uh, because we've recognized that um, you can't just run streaming services without running um, some kind of request response services, uh, and Istio, the ser Istio service mesh has been so helpful in that regard, we began running Istio-based uh, services. Um, Zipkin comes with that for almost for free. Um, and then we do our security um, overlay with DEX um, at, at the current, uh, presently. So this, uh, oh, the orientation was a little weird on the screen. Um, so we have data inbound uh, from various sources to NIFI and from Lambda directly into our Kafka topics. Uh, and so we have ingress and egress topic, Kafka topics, which establish the sort of black box for the platform, the decisioning platform. But the Kafka topics also run horizontally across uh, Flink apps, as I mentioned, um, for um, interim, you have interim topics um, for, uh, as, as sort of an application bus. Um, so you've got uh, m sort of monolithic Flink apps. We're going from the monolithic Flink apps to sort of more microservice-based Flink apps and using Kafka as the state mechanism in between. S3 also gets a copy of all of our data. So that big teardrop is the, is the NIFI or series of NIFI canva canvases with NIFI processors, which do the ETL for data, um, send copies of it to S3 for later querying. 
Um, and then the Flink decisioning delivers metrics back to Aurora, uses an, a Redis cache grid, um, and uh, then the final, uh, and then we have downstream queues uh, back to other um, enterprise service providers um, to say in, in, in cases of like fraud, you send the fraud alerts back to the investigators and that and, and as, as the entry point to their queues. So I won't spend too much time on the, on the T2 types if you were, happen to catch um, Nick's presentation yesterday from Pracoderm. It was excellent, download the deck. Um, we really are, uh, uh, the, the capabilities, I mean, definitely shout out to this community. Um, they're doing such interesting work for event-driven uh, versioned data sets that help in any sort of, you don't have to be mach doing machine learning, you don't even have to be doing decisioning just for doing uh, various kinds of data analysis, even in R. Um, you know, I don't know why I beat up on R, but I like beating up on R. Um, so our, our analytical environment, um, and some of this is, is, you know, this is a, I think what I'm talk talking through a series of patterns that Kubernetes has been uh, uh, very, uh, given us a lot of capabilities very quickly to launch these niche, um, this, these, these, what we thought were much more niche um, uh, application stacks, and it turns out to be, they, they actually turned out to be much more um, beneficial, or be beneficial in many ways, not only across the stack, but for many other kinds of business needs. So general business needs around decision and general business needs around um, analysis are sort of uh, endemic and um, omnipresent. So these patterns are, you know, f uh, very useful, um, and I can see them living, you know, a, a quite a long time and just being blown out to scale. Um, obviously, running ad hoc um, alongside your wrong side and in the same cluster as your OLTP and or traditional transactional flows has been some one of the riskier things that we've had to deal with. And um, Bryce is gonna talk a little bit about how uh, we ended up having to hedge our own ambitions um, with, with, um, with that. Um, so that definitely encourage you when you're looking at, the, to try to understand the behavior and then create some lessons or, or some guidelines and guardrails around the best, better behaving and or attract to better behavior for each one of, uh, each one of the kinds of workloads you run. Um, our telemetry stack right now, um, as I said, is um, sort of the traditional stack that you've seen probably across the conference, but our future state is to provide separate Grafana, Grafana um, stacks and uh, to, to customers, um, to, to tenants, and then to provide, um, keep FluentD um, in the mix, but allow teams to bring their own log aggregators and dashboards, since we see a mix of, you know, I, I'd like to have Splunk, I'd like to have um, something else, I'd like to do send to CloudWatch, et cetera. How am I doing on time? Okay, thank you. So what do we, maybe I should have put this slide a little bit earlier, what our state and multi-tenancy state for us, at, you know, going from 1.6, there wasn't as good support for state in 1.7. Um, we saw stateful sets and uh, become, emerge out of the, the betaware of pet sets, um, and they've been uh, rock solid for us on AWS. Um, and so, I mean, that's, that's been uh, some of the core reason to build a Kubernetes cluster is its stateful capabilities. Um, what do I mean by multi-tenancy? Um, I mean, isn't Kubernetes already multi-tenant? Yes, in the sense that you can deploy any kinds of workloads, but not in the sense that if you're running platforms, a platform as a service, what do you have to begin thinking about um, in terms of isolation? Uh, services designed to either be shared and or clustered, and you can be overly ambitious with sharing when in turn you should actually be isolating, which is some of our, our lesson with, with Flink and or how we'd like to probably end up uh, moving forward with Flink. Um, and and in, to that extent, because you have uh, applications that do their own clustering, the namespaces don't always solve all the forms of isolation, um, but that becomes you know, one of your alternatives. Um, and then, as I mentioned, some of the pain points at scale uh, to, of combining very different kinds of workloads together. Um, 
and without necessarily having guardrails around them first. So sometimes you just, you're gonna bring a new workload on, you may not know how it's going to, um, uh, how it's gonna turn out, so you have to be vigilant about it. Um, so again, what's the value of, of a managed service, like an internally managed platform to customers, uh, free from the 60-day um, compliance rehydration requirement, uh, just being able to focus on app de deployments. Um, so it's Kubernetes with benefits. We're giving them the cloud engineering, installation, persistent state, upgrades, patching, streamlined security, resiliency engineering, common telemetry, common domain. And as Gavin will demonstrate, we even give them uh, kind of domain-specific language CLI to deploy their, their apps um, so they can, so Kubernetes kind of becomes encapsulated and um, they can concentrate on, on, the, on their applications. Um, when you get things wrong, you'll start to hear, you know, the encapsulation gets broken and customers come out and say, you know, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll want their own uh, Kubernetes cluster. Um, their own um, their own fleet cluster access to the Kubernetes dashboard. Um, they'll demand more resources than you really want to provide. The whole idea being that you were bin packing resources to begin with to be, make um, your cloud uh, use of your cloud provider more efficient. Um, and everybody you know recognizes that that some need for el elasticity because they might have been coming from um, auto scaling groups um, with pure VMs and EC2 instances. Um, and they want more of that kind of thing in the cluster. So that's something we are definitely eager to leverage with Kubernetes and all the wor great work that's being done by the autoscaling SIG. Um, so we've got, um, like one of the things I talked about is trying to con get to an idea of, of uh, or you wanna be able, you wanna track to the idea of well-behaved workloads. We have an idea of a conformant cluster which provides portable workloads for customers, but for platform owners, I think going from you know, having um, uh, your customers come with their own CI, CD, CD tool tooling um, and or providing the DSL that, that uh, Gavin's gonna talk about um, or stop startable, rescheduleable and cord and drain friendly jobs. That, you know, these are important um, uh, be behaviors we expect from workloads good 12-factor app type behaviors like logging to standard out so you can take advantage of the, of the, of the uh, logging stack. Circuit breaker uh, connectivity and, and retry built in being kind of things that a lot of teams don't, a lot of application developers still don't think about even in a distributed world and we have to remind them of, you know, you don't come to us when, uh, you know, you can't connect to a service on three, you know, three times out of the day when you're normally connecting six million times. So those are normal types of blips, just retry. Um, um, so, and then going beyond liveness and, and readiness uh, metrics to exporting, you know, deeper health check, um, deeper, deeper, deeper health metrics. Um, so how many folks are running Kubernetes in production right now? A good many, about at least half the crowd. Um, and how many run with state? Like how many are running statefully? Cool. So almost the same amount, everybody's going for state. And then are you running it kind of for your own teams or are you running it as a service? So you're running, are you, yeah. So that, that's almost, um, that's sort of where, so I'll come back to that and talk a little bit about some of the, the, the things where we're seeing the, the cluster, uh, this kind of service going. And I'm gonna give it over to, to Bryce to talk about ops. Thank you, Keith. Hello, everyone. My name is Bryce. I want to talk about uh, some of the namespacing, tenant isolation. Uh, namespaces, what are they? Essentially a virtual cluster within Kubernetes. Um, so when we went down this path, um, our system apps as well as our tenant apps were all deployed in the same namespace. So we had uh, tenants stepping on, on each other's toes. So one tenant would update a secret or config map unaware that another tenant was using it. Um, so we, we decided to break out the deployments as well as namespaces for tenants. Uh, so we locked down the user policies via DEX and RBAC authentication and authorization solutions. I want to throw it out there that uh, we do not, um, we're not biased towards these. Uh, it, it was particularly for our process and our culture using LDAP um, as well as some of the user policy based you can get with RBAC. Uh, so we're, we're in the infancy stage of migrating from flannel to calico. And uh, with this, we can get enhanced pod-to-pod -pod communication security. All right, 
So how do we do state applications? And this is via the state full, I'm sorry, the persistent volume subsystem. What is that? Uh, two, two components, persistent volumes, which is a piece of storage somewhere. Persistent volume claim is a link to that storage. So that persistent volume is married with a pod. Wherever that pod moves in the cluster, persistent volume claim will move with it. And that way, any application can always access its data. So when we're talking distributed applications deployed on Kubernetes, uh, generally, say, okay, we'll, we'll give an example. etcd, Zookeeper, Kafka. Uh, with each, there's generally un a unique ID for each node. And that unique ID tells that node what subset of the data it's responsible for. So we can, we can leverage stateful sets to have that unique ID permeated throughout the various layers, the pod, the persistent volume claim, and the persistent volume. I want to throw it out there, storage classes, if used correctly, are sysadmin's best friend. What they can do is they can dynamically provision the persistent volumes as well as the underlying storage system via a cloud provider, say AWS EBS volume, or say uh, the equivalent on Google's cloud. So we are a bank. We do have compliance requirements, and one of which is the rehydration. So as Keith mentioned, we have to keep our nodes refreshed every 60 days, and this is to ensure the latest security updates and patches. We, uh, we leverage rehydration via a Kubernetes job, and subsequently we can also leverage it for upgrades. Well, what it does is it scales out, drains each node, ensures that persistent volumes are reattached to persistent volume, and before we scale in, we ensure that all the pods are healthy. Uh, when when we, we did the rehydration with an upgrade uh, months back, and it took about eight hours manually. And this was a cluster with a static etcd cluster, a masters. I'm uh, sorry, masters, we, we run the etcd with the masters, and we have a static set of those, of five nodes. The minions were about seven across AZs. Very large nodes. Uh, so what we did is, with, with this rehydration script, we've automated, we've, we've uh, executed it twice and been able to upgrade from 1.7 to 1.75 and then last week 1.75 to 1.83 and it's been very seamless. So as Keith mentioned we run a lot of Apache based JVM apps and uh, these JVM apps can get very unruly especially with memory. Um, so we, we've, we've encountered applications such as a Zeppelin where if they're scheduled on the same node Sometimes they take too much memory for that node and can have the node fall over subsequently. So pod anti-affinity, ensure that at most one pod per, per Zeppelin is on one node. Some, some good behaviors or, or good um, safety belts or uh, I guess, uh, um, well anyway, resource limits, limit ranges, and resource quotas. Resource limits essentially for each app, and this is you know, setting the limitation on CPU, memory, uh, limit ranges. If the, if the application developer does not set them, then it'll be the default CPU and memory for that uh, deployment, replica set, uh, whatever it may be. Resource quotas are setting the cap. So you can set a cap on, say, the secrets, uh, pods, the number of services for a given namespace, as well as the cap on the number of CPUs or uh, memory cores for a given namespace. And OK, it's Kubelet. There's, there's a very small nuance to this. There's, there's a property called system reserved to the Kubelet. And what this does is it ensures that there's always at least sufficient resources for CPU and memory on that Kubelet to always ensure that it's running if you have unruly pods. Something you want to throw out there uh, it can be your best friend. So uh, for the future, we definitely want to leverage some of the pod autoscalers, the horizontal and vertical autoscalers, as well as some of the node autoscalers. Uh, that can abstract out the cloud provider underneath. Um, so with a node autoscaler, we're hoping to uh, ha have tense tolerations as well as custom instance types, especially for our, our GPU-intensive model refit pipelines. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Gavin Mead. It's already on. No. Now it is. <laughs> All right. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. So. One of the cool things about being at this conference has been like 
where are we at like in our journey and our like ideas and like where we think we should be going. And like Kelsey Hightower's uh, keynote about how you shouldn't give developers cube cuddle access like has really resonated with us because for us like we're not a general purpose Kubernetes platform. Like Kubernetes really is a implement de implementation detail of like our service offerings. Like we offer Flink and Kafka and really for our application developers we want them to focus on their Flink app. Like their interaction model with the platform is I write a Flink app that consumes from a Kafka topic and then writes to a Kafka topic. Um, also another interesting talk was Diane Marsh's from Netflix, her, her talk about how culture can influence the tech. And that was really resonated with us as well because CICD is a really big thing at Capital One. It's something that we really have been pushing. The ability like for these Flink developers to be able to push their apps quickly. And so they were asking for tools like a CLI that they could use in their Jenkins jobs. And so that's what we wanted to give them. So the idea here is that we had a CLI that they could run from their local machine from when they're working in like a staging or a QA, but then also the same CLI could be installed on uh, Jenkins. You know, it was a Go app and it can be installed. We had builds for both uh, Mac and uh, Linux. And the way that was set up is we have an ALB and a set of microservices that listen for those various CLI commands. Internally, or ingress is done via HTTPS, um, but the communication between the microservices is done via gRPC. We use Istio as a service mesh for those microservices, and the really great thing is that that worked like right out of the box. Um, like setting up the sidecar was a breeze using a, you know, Istio Cuddle. We also are using Zipkin for our tracing, so all of our microservices are traced, and the one microservice there that talks to Flink what it does is it communicates with the Flink job manager uh, REST API to do the actual deployment. Like, is anyone here familiar with Apache Flink? Done any development? Yeah, a couple, okay, cool. So what we try to do is simulate the job manager submission, but we try to add some additional functionality. So one of the things that we add is we will watch the deployment for a fixed amount of time and capture all of the states that that Flink job is transitioned into. So as an example, it could go from starting to running, and if it stays in that state, we're in good shape. But if it went to starting, to failing, to restarting, we would be able to give that information back to the customer, and then they can kind of further troubleshoot to see what's going on. One of the things that Keith alluded to is our sort of shared model and some of the learning opportunities that came from this. You know, we run a shared Flink cluster, right now, um, but we realize that it's kind of hard to put some guardrails around that in terms of like maximum number of task slots that you can use. Um, the other thing is because we're not using something like Yarn, um, one job can, it's, can have a disproportionate like, negative effect on the overall cluster. And you know, we've we talked about possibly using Yarn with Flink, but we feel like Kubernetes can provide a lot of that capability, you know, at least with respect to CPU and memory usage for us. Um, and the other thing is they were asking for their own clusters. So where we're at kind of in our journey and where we're starting to move is this idea of letting more of a self-service model let the customer create their clusters, like however it is they want. I mean, we would have the appropriate guardrails in place with respect to resource limits, but how they carve it out is up to them. So the same idea is to use, like say a Flink create cluster, and the same sort of ingress provisioning, but now we're really looking at CRDs. Like we've been really inspired by the talks we've seen about operators, like there was a great talk earlier about Kafka operators, the core OS folks with the Prometheus and etcd operator, which we are using both, um, have, have been really fantastic and are a great way to kind of get started with them. And so what we're really looking at is like our future state is a more self-service model where the customer, we would basically provision them, say a Grafana dashboard with some curated dashboards, set up their own Prometheus server to capture their metrics, and then they can decide how they want to alert. You know, one cluster, if they want a shared one, but say they have one that's critical, they could provision just one Flink job 
to that particular cluster and then do their other operational stuff on another one. Um, we really want to put it in their hands. The other thing is we're looking at um, more CNCF uh, tools. So we are evaluating Jaeger right now to see as a replacement for uh, Zipkin. And I went to the Jaeger talk yesterday and it was really awesome. Um, and then actually with that, Keith is gonna take us home. <laughs> so uh, some of the, thank, thank you both, that was awesome. I, people ask me what I do and um, with the dynamism in the Kubernetes community um, and almost, and, and also tr you know, dodging you know, architectural and going through architectural reviews sometimes, we're actually doing the work in the cluster you know, while we're proving it out. Um, and in a way it's made us pretty fearless. Um, sometimes that, that gets a little scary because you, when you come from a more compliance-based environment, there usually a more, lot more all the process gates and design. Um, but Kubernetes has really given us a lot of flexibility to test things out more quickly than we would normally be able to do in a normal um, uh, system delivery workflow, uh, software delivery workflow as well. So, so this gives, you know, I tell people, you know, what do you do? They say, I say, I feel like I'm an in-flight drone maintenance technician. Um, and so we've gone, this is just a few of the things we've gone from, you know, AVUFS to, to Overlay 2, from Rail to Ubuntu, um, NiFi, and we're starting to start to delever NiFi because it's a little, a little bit difficult to orchestrate some of the canvases. Uh, a, little, a little more GUI, uh, have a bigger GUI footprint. We kind of like Kafka Connect as a replacement for that. Um, but going from InfluxDB and Heapster to Prometheus, given the awesome work in the, by the Prometheus community. Um, EFK to sort of the fluent bit plus BYO log aggregation. Ignite for heavyweight cache grid um, to Redis. SkyDNS to CoreDNS, S3 Direct to Minio, et cetera. So this kind of gives you um, I don't know if your journey has been like that, but we've just been churning through things, evaluating them quickly in implementations, in production even, and then you know where they fail, okay, we move on. And um, I mean, this is so much of, in some ways we, we, we are encapsulating Kubernetes from our, uh, from, from our end users, but in the same way our, speed, our time to market uh, for the platform and platform services is entirely, almost entirely due to the uh, Kubernetes capabilities. Uh, conclusions, uh, let me see. So, uh, you know, if, if you're running Kubernetes, I would encourage you to think about what you're running it for, what kind of managed service if you take on any number of different kinds of workloads, you could get into trouble. Um, we've carved out the decisioning space for our cluster. Folks have come to us and said, we'd like to run, uh, we, were, we like to run our NiFi jobs there. We like to run, put all our Kafka topics there. For us, that's, we're not a Kafka as a service, we're not a NiFi as a service, we're a decisioning platform as a service. Um, so deciding what kind of uh, Kubernetes uh, cluster you're going to run is really important. What kind of service are you going to offer um, if that's the kind, if you are a managed service provider in that regard? Um, I love the, the, the DSL, uh, domain specific language, CLI based insulation, because you get the, both the benefit of being a DSL and working with the CI and CD tools. Um, state's going to creep in. It's almost impossible to avoid it, as even especially for running resilient clusters going, as we look to go cross region and, and um, and multi-cloud, uh, you've got state to manage and state to maintain. That's gonna, that's inevitable. Um, yeah, unchecked um, and especially ad hoc workloads, you've got to really look at re putting resource limits on them so you don't get kind of the tragedy of the commons. Um, you, you are likely, almost already likely multi-tenant. You may not even realize it, even with your own ops jobs. Um, we've seen, and I think it was, is it Jevons paradox? Is that what people have been quoting here? We see it all the time, because I see the slope of the, of our, our, of the line for the storage that we provision for our stateful uh, workloads just continue to climb, almost hockey sticking. Um, Cluster supporting streaming service, we thought we were, oh, we were just going to be a streaming service cluster. You still need request response services. And so thinking through how you're going to host REST and or gRPC facing, gRPC customer facing services, obviously Istio is, is um, the go-to there. Uh, and given Kubernetes extensibility, that's all working, that's so many great things work in progress. We see more and more specialized clusters coming. I've seen it in robotics automation, uh, decisioning, uh, you've seen some of it in machine learning already here. Um, so great stuff that's, that's coming. Um, 
Community shout out, wanted to say thank you to Sam Brown. Sam, raise your hand uh, for organizing the Nova Kubernetes Meetup. If you're in the Northern Virginia area, DC area, please come. Uh, really excited to um, grow that community. Um, and um, uh, yeah, uh, thank you all.